Well, um, I, I totally disagree. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, I actually find very little to disagree uh, with with what Peter said. Um, I, I think that um, uh, pretty much I, I could say ditto uh, to everything. I mean, I think the uh, the trends that he points out are um, uh, you know quite alarming and and, and distressing. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully that um, you know, the debate as it, as it played out in the United States, I think, uh, largely uh, played out the, with the, the right outcome. Um, and it looks like in the rest of the world is uh, you know, threatening to kind of bring us back to battles that were, were fought and I think largely won here. And I think that's, that's troubling. And hopefully we can bring our experience um, with the issue uh, to have some uh, impact and influence uh, with, with, with other countries that are trying to uh, uh, make the, the same mistakes that uh, were almost made here um, in, in, in what they're doing. Uh, that's all I really have. I don't really have a lot to, to add. Okay. Questions, comments from the audience? Yes. <coughs> uh, um, I'd, like, I'd like to broaden this just a little bit because what fascinates me about this whole thing is not the encryption angle per se, but the notion that society is somehow obligated to rend its in communications and information infrastructure in order to allow or retain or maintain access by government authorities. Uh, and, and that's an issue, you know, not only overseas, but it's an issue here, not with respect to encryption per se, but, but with respect to, to other forms of access and, and, and wiretap. And so I'm just wondering if, if, if Peter and Dan could comment on, on, on what I heard. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, and I personally find it a very, very peculiar contention that, the, you know, my, my interpretation of what I hear from the FBI and DOJ, what have you, this notion that we're obligated to do whatever it takes to make sure that they can still get a data. So I, so I think that's the CALEA issue in the United States, the Computer Systems to Law Enforcement. 1994, the U.S. Congress passed and President Clinton signed a law that said that phone companies have to make the phone networks wiretap ready. And the big compromise that was put into that, pushed largely by Jerry Berman and the CDT, was it didn't apply to IP. And then the Internet took off after that. And the battleground is, as we use Skype and other kinds of Internet protocol phone communications, how much is the government going to insist that we make Skype and the rest of that stuff wiretap capable? And that's being fought over with RIM, it's being fought over with Skype, and I think it's an important issue for the people here to weigh in on. The U.S., uh, the current administration has not taken a position on Kalia update. The FBI clearly would like to expand Kalia much further, and the Commerce Department and other parts of the administration have been much more cautious about that. So I'm not sure if there's been a 5G tour or a development for people to use the data that's stored on the commercial server, but there's a lot of what's happening. So, so the question is, what about Tor? And, and, and I, I think there's a lot of reason for the tech people that historically have been a core part of CFP to keep coming up with these anonymizing technologies and, and to really push back against pervasive wiretaps. And if we're more effective at doing that in the United States and Europe, we'd be more effective at doing that around the world um, where authoritarian regimes or other regimes have reasons to really try to, to, try to uh, get access to all the communications. Right, one more question. Uh, so I was just going to comment that even if India had a much uh, stronger encryption law, the government is still allowed to the information the act to ask any intermediary to provide any records uh, for the for state integrity or what helping friendly governments. And right now, India is defending in ways that may the most of the So it, that's why the medical records that it might be possible that it might be easier for law enforcement in the United States to get those medical records from India than to get them to Right, so um, certainly the United States law enforcement and national security entities um, have worked with other countries to get access to data that they don't get in the U.S. And whether that's Echelon or other things, that's been a long uh, history. 
I, I think, though, that um, what's new in this round about India and China is you know, billion-plus people, countries, that have on the books laws against effective encryption. And so the internet going forward will be shaped in part by whether the default is to have good encryption. And, and I think that's, that's part of what my project is about, is to try to help show why the arguments that won for strong encryption in the United States should win for these very, very populous other countries. Okay, next topic. And this is the nothing to hide argument. Well, an argument that's often, uh, another argument that's very frequently made in the privacy and, and, and security debates is that um, why should we be so concerned over some of the information the government's going to gather through surveillance because I have nothing to hide. Um, I'm not embarrassed by anything that I do. I don't care if the government sees what books I read, what, what water I drink, whatever. Um, and the only people who should really care are people who are engaged in illegal activity because they have something to hide. And this argument just occurs again and again and again. And I, I think that one of the things I wanted to do was to come up with, um, I hope, a very persuasive reply to it, to try to really kill this argument. Um, and I think if you, you know, one way to fight the argument is say, well, everyone has something to hide. Uh, and, and therefore it's just wrong. But, but that's not going to convince the people who say they have nothing to hide. Um, what I think the response is, is that the nothing to hide argument views privacy in a very narrow and myopic way. It sees privacy as basically hiding bad and embarrassing things. But that's actually just one dimension of what privacy is all about. There's many dimensions to privacy um, that have really nothing to do with hiding things. Uh, I worked out uh, several years ago, I, I worked on a theory of privacy, and I, I came to the conclusion that privacy isn't just one thing, it's actually many different related things, but they're distinct things. Um, and some of the, the aspects of privacy that have nothing to do with hiding things are, one, uh, rights to access the information uh, that others have about you, to know what that information is, um, to be able to correct it if it's inaccurate, um, you know, a problem that I call exclusion when you're denied access and participation in the use of your data. This, this has nothing to do with hiding things. Um, another thing is um, uh, there's a lot of instances where your privacy has nothing to do about um, keeping something secret. You know, your right not to have your face plastered on a billboard um, for someone else's product. That is uh, not about the secrecy of your name or likeness. It's about your right to control your identity, your right to control your personal information, which again has nothing to do with hiding things. Uh, another issue is the aggregation problem. That when people give out information, you know, I might say, look, you know, I like, I, I like to drink this water rather than another water. I like this thing. I bought a magazine here. I bought a book. Um, each piece of data in, in isolation is fairly innocuous. But people don't realize how much can be gleaned about a person's life when you start aggregating all these different pieces of data together and looking at um, all this different data. So when you look at each individual isolated question, issue with data, you might have nothing to hide, but when you put all the data together, it might actually uh, paint a picture about you. And then there's the judgments made based on this information. The judgments made on the information might not necessarily be accurate, because you could have nothing to hide, but still, bad judgments making bad inferences um, could be made about your behavior. Um, and um, one of the things in, about living in a free society is not having to explain or justify oneself to the government, not having to worry about how people might misjudge us. So if I buy a book on manufacturing meth, um, I don't want to have to explain or worry about explaining why I bought that book to some you know, nervous law enforcement official who thinks I'm up to no good, I, I shouldn't have to explain the reason uh, why, even if I'm acting totally innocently. Um, that shouldn't be something that I have to do. Um, so these are just some of the reasons why I think the nothing to horror argument really just misses out on what privacy is all about, because it's way, way too narrow. Uh, so in, during the um, last several years after the, after the attack on 9-11, I think we heard this, we have nothing to hide argument, to, to just don't worry about privacy a lot. And Dan Soloff did a great service with an essay that got some kind of record number of downloads, I think, on SSRN by, by doing the essay on, on uh, why um, uh, it's a bad argument. So I commend, I commend the essay and I guess the whole book to you for that reason. 
Here's a way to make nothing to hide arguments slightly different. If you look at the history in the United States of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and how we got those privacy laws in place, it was things like this. It turned out Martin Luther King was being wiretapped. It turned out that the opposition political party was being broken into by the president's political thugs. It turned out the FBI was bragging in internal emails that they wanted the anti-war protesters in the Vietnam era. They wanted the protesters to think there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. And if you think about the threat to political freedom that comes from having that kind of pervasive fear and surveillance, then even if each of us is as perfect as, we, as our parents aspire for us to be, even if we have nothing to hide because we're, we're without sin, and most religious traditions don't think we're without sin, we still have a political threat if these sorts of uh, if surveillances and invasions go on. And so in some ways, to me, it's a political theory answer. We, we, it, I don't care whether I have nothing to hide. I care a lot if they are seeing so much that they can exercise political control and dominion over all of us. And I think that's the core of uh, at least a, one big reason why we should reject the nothing to hide our Comments, questions from the audience? Yes. Martina, 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 Martina. Could, you, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, Pablo Molina with Georgetown University, also on the board of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Uh, part of the problem is the interpretation of the information over which we have no control and third parties are looking at that information. I subscribe to Netflix, I'm an Indian from Spain, I wanted to watch all the Almodovar movies recently. And then I got an email message from Netflix saying, based on your past movies, these are some gay and lesbian movies that may interest you. I'm <laughs> to find out about these. This morning, I was helping my daughter with her social science project, 10-year-old daughter, uh, uh, researching terrorism in the 90s in the United States. So I downloaded pictures of the Oklahoma City bombings, the, uh, the World Trade Center, uh, track bomb, uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabombers. I'm expecting somebody to knock on my door and say, I'm an animal, and we expect this uh, radiation anytime soon. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, exactly. I think that, that there's a lot of uh, wrong inferences and, and wrong judgments that can be made on our information. Um, and, um, you know, part of privacy is protecting ourselves against those judgments being made based on information fragments that are kind of out there that the government can grab its hands on uh, and then piece together in certain ways or, or plug through some algorithm then to come up with, you know, you said the word bomb five times in an email, therefore you must be a terrorist. Um, I, and I think that um, we want to protect against those inferences through, through privacy. So I think the claim of privacy is not you know, a claim to hide bad things that one's doing, it's to hide legitimate things, legal things, totally fine things that people are doing, because they don't want you know, stupid, bad inferences made by people uh, you know, looking at and piecing together fragments without the full context. We have one other question up the front, um, I'm Jeremy Scott, I'm a summer clerk at Edward. I was wondering if both of you could comment on the, the, the need and the want for more information as kind of a, a crux for actually dealing with the real issues. A lot of times it seems like the government collects a lot of information and thinks it's trying to make us feel better about other things they're doing, but they don't they kind of hide the ball in terms of what would be really effective methods preventing terrorism and things of that nature. Yeah, I, I could speak to that really briefly and then and here, but I think that there is this sort of, I think it almost goes to the false trade-off. Like if security measure looks really ominous, if there's you know, guns and lots of data gathered and it's really inconvenient and you're stripped naked, it must be effective. Um, and it's, it's, it's a form of what Bruce Schneider calls to some extent you know, security there, sort of making a measure that looks really, really bad um, so that people think, oh, it must you know, it, it, it must be good because if the government's gathering all this data, it must be helping us. And a lot of times it's false. It actually isn't particularly effective um, uh, and, and isn't the best security measure that we, we could be doing. Yeah. 